good evening. Thank you for coming. Welcome to SciArc. What I asked uh, Mr. Weinstein to my right to do, and he was gracious enough to do it, is to provide some uh, modicum of moderation, which means he'll be the moderator. So Richard will be the moderator, Wolf and I will talk, or Richard will intervene as he sees fit. Richard. I want to explain what the design of the evening is. They're going to be, we agreed this morning, Robbie, that each of us to my right and left would present 15 slides with some commentary. Wolf has broken the rule. He has 18 slides. This is going to be my problem. How to deal uh, with Wolf and Eric in a way that is at least somewhat focused. So I apologize in advance for any route on my part toward uh, the right or the left. I'm gonna ask a few questions to get things going after the slides. Can you, can everybody hear Richard or no? Yeah. It's that that I was concerned about. It's the feedback. We're going to start with 15 slides. Wolf has 18. Now so we'll let that go by. And I'll try and keep these characters. Uh, on the subject, and um, I can't I, hear you. You can't hear me, Wolf. You don't need to hear, you don't need to hear me. <laughs> okay. And then um, we'll try and have a conversation, mostly between uh, Eric and Wolf. Uh, and then uh, at the when I decide it's time. Uh, we'll bring the conversation to a close, and we'll finish with five slides from each shown together, and that'll be the end of the evening. Now, er Eric asked me to say a few things to begin with, which I'm happy to say because I know firsthand that the basic sentiment is a true one. Bernard Shaw made the comment, which I saw in Eric's office this morning, every profession is a conspiracy against the public. <laughs> it is also true that most architects conspire against each other, or at least follow the Hungarian saying, that it is not enough that you should succeed, your friend has to fail also. The reverse is the case with these two who have known each other for a long time, and for that time, out of a generosity bred by sympathy, rejoiced in each other's successes. This is not usual. Many in the audience have yet to learn how it feels to lose a commission, to someone less talented, less principled, and less needy than you. Over time, this experience can ruin your manners. And as manners are little morals, eventually, some architects may find the way to success made up of the small breaches of principle that feed ambition. When this happens, the conspiracy that Shaw spoke of is born. 
These conspiracies may not only disadvantage the public, but they can corrode friendships and promote mediocrity. You may think what you like about the work. Is it grotesque or admirable? Is it admirable because it is new or new because it is grotesque? Must it be odd to be authentic? Is it even admirable to be authentic? Or is it better to be comfortable? As Klaus Oldenburg says, I'm for an art that helps old ladies across the street. Whatever you may think about the work and its many resonances, you need also appreciate the quality of the friendship which has sustained their relation against the jealousies, competitiveness, conspiracies, and ambitions which the architectural flesh is usually heir to. So, shoulder to shoulder and back to back, moss and bricks. This is the sound is terrible. I'm complaining like always. Yeah. Okay, I've Get on it. <laughs> instead of um, having 15 plus five slides, I have 23, which gives a good number: five, two, and three. But uh, since that is very unfair to Eric, um, I would say that you have to close their eyes for three images, then we are even. I, I added a few, I didn't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I have more, I can <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I have more. Um, I had an interesting uh, discussion the other day about the development of uh, music of, let's say, rock and roll music. And it turned out, since uh, people can download uh, the music from, from the internet, um, the, uh, the, the, the groups don't earn money anymore, neither the industry. So they have to go back to the stage and perform. If we draw a line between music and architecture, could that be that that would happen to architecture as well? You know, the magazines are going down. You have no architectural magazine in the States, just one. And no one actually is interested in architecture anymore. And you can't read. And uh, you cannot read articles about architecture that often and you don't see images anymore. So you have to go on site. You have to go and see the building. And I think the next step in architecture will be decided on site. That means if I um, would evaluate architecture on three levels, namely Gestalt, form, program, or technique, which is, could be structure or material, then two of them have to be visionary, otherwise... Hey, Wolf, Wolf, show the slides and we'll talk the interesting talk. No, 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 I have to get into the language. Since I can't hear me, <laughs> so I don't know when I have to stop. Yeah? Stop. <laughs> Great. Show the slides. No, sir, I stop. You can't do that to me. Yeah. 
I have to go, I have to go into the language. I told you that. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, come on. No one. So I show these 18 slides. <laughs> Close your eyes whenever you want, but you have to cut out three. Uh, See, I can see it, you can't see it. Come on, nice. So these are my slides. <laughs> Eric, your turn. Go back one. Yeah, wait. I can't. Okay, very nice slides. <laughs> One. No, go ahead. You should go. Very nice, huh? I should have brought the chaplain, the chaplain slide. Yeah, it's nice. Could you, could you go back to the second one, please? I'd like to see that again. Nice. Look, animation. Just <laughs> nice. Just to relax, I have to figure it out. Oh. What? Well, you should go ahead. Can you? Okay. We're going to wind up talking about dancing anyway, so it's my, my turn to dance. Why don't you flip that on, Jack, and I'll, I'll uh, Wolf can go second and I'll, I'll go first. Can you do that? <laughs> I think. <laughs> so that's, that's not the other architect. Uh, I, I selected, uh, whoops, I selected uh, 15 images uh, in order to raise uh, questions which I think either are, are relevant to, to me in a personal way as an architect or questions that might be relevant uh, to you as as students, and I guess finally questions that that uh, might be relevant in an educational way. When we first started to put this thing together, we were talking about schools. Wolf obviously runs a school in Vienna. Schools, mules, fools, tools, whatever it was. So there is there is a private aspect to this. There's I think a student aspect to this and, and uh, an educational concern that I have. So what, what I'll do, as we agreed to do, is just to go through uh, a series of images and make a comment or two, and then we can, we can uh, determine the efficacy of the comments uh, as we go. I'm intrigued uh, by, by the emotive power of, yeah. of the the image, and I think interested in in the transformative capacity of architecture to pick us up and carry us somewhere we haven't been before. Next, not so clear the image. This is this is Petra. Uh, this this has to do with with mutability, uh, building and land, what constitutes a building, and I think uh, uh, of of great consequence to me is is the durability of ideas. There are a lot of discussions that have to do with this is the 70s and this is the 80s and this is the 90s and therefore this is antiquated. So uh, I want I want 
to raise that question in terms of, is it out of fashion? Is it old fashioned? We don't need to look at this anymore or not. Next. Uh, this is, uh, Mars has two moons. Uh, in case you didn't realize that the study of architecture also involved the study of astronomy. And actually, the, the broader question is, what are the limits of the subject? What are the limits of the architecture subject? Uh, this is Phobos, uh, one of the Martian moons. There are two that dance around and follow the planet uh, through the sky. Uh, I've, I've, I think, always been intrigued by the, the, the potency of the, of the form and its, 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 its movement somehow between something you recognize, which might be spherical, and something moving in the opposite direction towards something that you don't quite know and the tension between those two uh, possibilities. Next. Uh, this has to do with, with the city and a fluid image of the city in the process of becoming. So that the city is getting old and the city is getting new and the city is in motion perpetually. And the question is, when you look at the image and the two pieces or the two constituent pieces, which piece is the former and which piece is the latter. Next. Uh, this I pulled out of the New York Times the other day, and this is the bombing in, in, in Bali. And, and all of us should wonder, I certainly do, about the language of, 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 uh, that's expressed here. Uh, uh, the, 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 the question of destruction and demolition and whether that has something to do with, with a, putting a real face on something that I've advocated in a very different way, in a kind of intellectual way, and whether the fact of Bali the, the physical fact of Bali, and you could say the World Trade Center also uh, affects the advocacy of, of the taking apart and the remaking of the idea of building what it is, what are its constituent parts. Next. Uh, I, I, I think this, this has to do with, with the movement of space. I, I think the idea that, 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 that motion and that a kinetic idea is, is essential and that the subject matter or the paradigm is provisional and that the, and that the motion is constant. Next. This is a different subject. It's an, it's an, it's an old uh, project. It, it goes back about uh, 20 years or so. And, and it raises a different kind of question, which is balance and equilibrium. Uh, it, it may be the balance of an acrobat on a wire, but whether there's a kind of stasis or, or point of rest or control in architecture or not. Next. Uh, this is a painting that, that uh, I used uh, recently and unsuccessfully to, to try to convince the GSA that it would be possible to be radical and conservative simultaneously. It's a 19th century painting, you know it. It's by Seurat, Sunday in the Park. And it, 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 in a sociological sense, everyone is in a proper place and everyone's properly dressed and everyone is behaving. And of course, the technical side of the painting, the, the, the points and the dots, is the radical aspect of the painting. So it has a sociological aspect, which is conservative and, and a technical and, and, and spatial a mechanism, which is radical. So both exist simultaneously. Next. Next. Uh, this has to do with viewing and uh, seeing uh, and, and understanding. And, and over the years, I think I've 
gotten involved with with the conception of space which which actually can't be photographed can't be photographed certainly from a single vantage point and this this raises a question of a conception of space and how one is to understand it and Can represent it color? next uh, this is this is illustrative you, you of change the color of the projection. I'm sorry. Yeah. Maybe. What the hell is going on? <laughs> the relationships are actually pretty good between between the two. Um, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> smoking nice, huh? smoking the same cigarette. <laughs> uh, but this, this is on, on uh, your right is is uh, a study model, a, a current study model, which which actually has in it uh, uh, the fundamental issue of of the obligation of pieces to each other, how they work on one another, uh, in a hierarchical sense, in a structural sense, in a surface sense, in a spatial sense. Next. And again, next. <clears throat> this is not the same scheme. This is a different scheme. Next. Uh, this this I, I use just to raise the uh, the subject of experiment. Uh, experiment in terms of space and technical experiment in terms of the glass is a laminated glass it hadn't been done before the concrete which is the sprayed concrete and and uh, further perhaps the question of of why experiment next uh, and this is this is uh, a, a sense for me that that Buildings have become not a not a destination or an objective, but a transformative aperture. So that what you saw through in the previous slide gives you the result on the wall. Next, a different way to look. Uh, this is an excavation at at the Valley of of Ashes uh, in Queens. Um, which raises an, a, a number of important questions, including art as the, the display of art in a competitive venue. We, we refer to this as art on the way to the zoo, and art on the way to baseball, and so on. So art not in terms of its introverted meanings, but art in terms of a promotional <coughs> component. Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, this has come to be known in, in St. Petersburg as the ice Why? cube. Uh, both words, uh, uh, this actually wasn't, wasn't my term, ice with its uh, uh, connotations of, of uh, both precision and, and, and the changing of form so that it's a cube but it's on the way to becoming Let's find out what next. And uh, this is uh, down uh, the road a bit, the ice uh, berg, uh, as, it's, as it's come to be known, and, and also raises, uh, I think, uh, a critical question, one, one that, that has to do with, with an intervention and a transformation in a 19th century neoclassical city and how those kinds of, of, of subjects are put together next. Uh, it's the flying horse, I guess. Yeah, the image. So I'll 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 describe it for you. It's a it's it's a horse in the sky. It comes from a film made in 1928 by a, a Swedish film director called Victor Seastrom, and it has to do with making the intangible tangible, or in a way with building the wind. 
how to build the wind. Thank you. My turn. So. So what are you looking for? <laughs> I would say technical problems. Yeah, okay. When I'm talking about architecture, I'm talking about um, dynamic forces, um, natural forces which create space like clouds. This is actually our first project we did 30 years ago or 35 years ago in 68. It's called cloud because we wanted to make architecture buoyant, flexible, like clouds. And this is still an issue which is in the forefront of our work. Um, figure and ground, uncertain ground, but the figures are still at um, ident identification points. This is ar architecture nowadays. Uh, figure and ground. Um, Piranesi, where space becomes a video clip. Cantilevering gestalten, which is very important for us because cantilevering is for sure the next step in architecture. Uh, towers as symbols for urban spaces. Roofs which are indicating that there is something beneath it. We don't know what it is, but the shape of the roof indicates the space. The weakest point in architecture is the moment of designing. And since we always wanted to change architect in a radical way, we found out that the mo if you can change the moment of designing, maybe architecture will be, or space could be liberated. The drawing was a tool for that 15 years ago. How far can you go with a drawing? Um, it burns into the skin. Skin is an issue in architecture as well. Um, how far can you drive an object? Set it in flame in the middle of a city. Uh, we had to get a, a building permit for this burning wing. Density, density, vertical density is an issue. Horizontal density, the, the public and private space. Uh, public and private space as a symbol for a motor or a point of departure in urban uh, designing. Diagram model of a roof. A roof which indicates, as I said, um, the space beneath, beyond it, and the space beyond it is shaped by the roof. Clouds. So I can, I can leave that forever, yeah? Because actually this, uh, this is uh, the point of departure of, of, of the roof we did for BMW. So? One of the subjects that we agreed to touch upon 
uh, is the subject of schools and how they make architects. So I would like to ask the following question of Eric, and then let's uh, hope the conversation develops uh, organically from there. And the, the questions are going to sound a little dumb, but the responses will be more interesting, I guarantee. What are the priorities of an architecture school? What should be? The question was a very prosaic question, uh, or maybe not. What are, what are the priorities of an architecture school? Um, I, this reminds me of, of uh, an essay in the, the first Rizzoli book we did a long time ago. The opening essay was, was originally titled, Which Lie Do You Want to Tell? Uh, and uh, the editor, fearing that uh, we would lose even more projects, uh, retitled it, Which Truth Do You Want to Tell? Uh, I, I think uh, whether whether he was successful or not, I'm not I'm not so sure. I think uh, that that Syarch is probably not particularly interested in in pontificating. So uh, whether uh, there is a generic list of priorities uh, in education uh, uh, is a separate question. But I can I think I can try to uh, make my way through that uh, question in terms of what we are interested uh, in doing here with some kind of caveat about ecumenical and shared voices and shared interests and, and uh, debate. Uh, I think all of that seems to be a part of, of the process. It's an amorphous part. I think a director has to decide, and a director has to listen, and a director has to do something somewhere in between. Those are all roles, or at least their their uh, roles uh, here. I think I was I was uh, particularly uh, there are attitudinal questions and there are technical and spatial and organizational questions. And, and uh, I think it's, it's for me, uh, important that the school is not a school with allegiances. I think, I think the development of, of a critical mind and a critical perspective on the part of students, I think, is, is, uh, is one essential uh, ingredient here which ultimately means we, we, we have to hear a number of voices and, 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 and a number of, of points of view. I think, I think the, uh, another, another question has to do with the intersection of a student, and maybe not only a student, but also an adult, with, with the world, and that the world isn't only what it is in an extroverted sense, which tells you you have to do this with the building department, and this with the building code, and this with the budget, and this with the program. I think in a very fundamental way, SciArc has always made a strong effort to create a student who, who feels that the world in a very fundamental way belongs to them, that they can make it and shape it and move it and alter it. And all of that takes a kind of, a kind of courage and I think fundamentally a dissatisfaction with the way things are, that the world will move. I don't think this is a school that believes in progress in a conventional sense, but, but that, that the game will change, that the rules will change, that the concept will change, and that, that it's important for, for people who are part of this amalgamation to participate in that debate in moving in, in, in moving the discussion forward, I think uh, there, there probably one other one other ingredient in all of this, and it might go back to the to the the Frankenstein image, which has just to do with with 
the, the prowess, the power, the potency, the transformative capacity of architecture in, in individual buildings, in pieces of buildings, in pieces of cities, in cities, to, to say to the world what it could do, or what it could feel, or what it might think, or what values it might share. It has to do that, though, not only in an intellectual way, it has to do it in, in its own language, which is inevitably a language of shape and space and form and surface and structure. And I think because of that, we, we are very interested in, in emphasizing now what it actually takes to make things, not in a graphic way or an ethereal way, but in a tangible, substantive way as construction. So that the objective of architecture is to build buildings and to transform our vision of the way things might be. I don't think, or I, I think that um, we cannot teach architecture because it's a self-learning process. So everyone who is concerned with architecture has to teach himself, herself, um, otherwise he will never get to the status of being an architect. But what we can teach, or what we try to teach in Vienna is that an architect who doesn't want to change society stays as a builder. So therefore, we have to ask for, if we are teaching, in a, if we are running a school, we have to ask um, for the role of the architect in the future which in my point of view will be dramatically changing in the next years. On one hand, you will have the architect who is uh, the facility manager. He's just the guy who is rendering uh, images for, um, for the developer. On the other hand, you can be, and this is the major point, you can be a strategic thinker who really thinks about more than architecture. Um, but I have a good memory of, of, of one school, architectural school. This is SIAG, because when I started to teach here, it was 86, 87, I met Eric. He was sitting on a in a studio which uh, was on it was somewhere very intense place he was sitting on a chair and when i came uh, to the room he said oh i know you you are the brother of my left hand so i think um, as a teacher or as a, as a dean of a school you have to provide the students that they have to learn that information we can give them only get knowledge through experience. And then um, this is the circle going back to the first statement that you cannot teach architecture. Wait a minute, let me, let me, um, because I, I think Wolf, Wolf said something important. I just, I just wanted to, uh, to echo it. Uh, the, the question it really has to do with whether this whole thing is a scam or not. In other words, in other words, I think what he's saying, and maybe it's not so clear, or maybe it could be clarified, is can you teach the subject? Can you teach somebody to make these these kinds of things? And I think what what he's saying further is that in a sense you can teach around it, and talk around it, and you can you can make 
the arsenal, and maybe this is not the right metaphor, and maybe it is, you can make certain kinds of things available in terms of technical information and represent, uh, representational techniques and conceivably ways to think and, and to understand and to think independently and critically and to have the courage to do all of that. And if you add all of that stuff up, the question is, what do you get? And, and what you get, obviously, over many years and many students and many interests and many perspectives is quite a range of issues. And I think it's probably fair to say and fair for the audience to understand that we're probably talking about a very particular kind of definition of what architecture means. And, and what would follow from that, maybe this is the next question, is to whom are we talking? Who participates in this discussion? Uh, that gets to the question I was going to ask you both. For most of the history of architecture, architecture has been the servant of the establishment and its role has been to assert the values of the establishment. You both speak of architecture as transformative, that to be an architect you have to be dissatisfied with society and want to change it. That would seem to be a new role for the architect since for most of human history that is not how the architect thought of what he was doing. What's changed? Since when? <laughs> Since when? Since the architect became a hero who wants to transform the world. I think um, every good architect that wanted to transform the world back to the history. This is, the, this is our goal. If we don't do it, we, we stay uh, in the status of just being builders. Yeah? And this is what we can teach, yeah? how to do it. Yeah? Foundation, structure, a roof, and that's it. But talking about space is more than uh, information. You have to have experience the space and that you have to learn by yourself. You can teach people to look at it, but they have to open their eyes. So the role, the, good architects, or good architecture was always a, a, a trial to, 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 to change, transform reality into the next step. I would argue that's not responsive to the question. Yeah, this was intention. <laughs> this, this is like, do you know the American program Meet the Press? You know, where the, where the, where the news person asks the question, yeah, but this and then is, the person answers whatever they want to answer. Right, they answer a different question. This, this is right. routine. <laughs> yeah, right. If you don't know the answer, you have to answer anyway. I, this is architecture, actually. I, I think... Uh, again, in, to, in terms of to whom is this discussion directed, I think, I think what we're really talking about is, is, is a question of, of being dissatisfied with the status quo. And, and this, is, this is actually, uh, this is Job's subject or Gilgamesh's subject. Uh, these are old subjects. And I think if, if you're uncomfortable with the condition that you find yourself in a sociological way or in a personal way, you try to find a way to make a new form or order or construction, and you do this with your life. Actually, people have done this for a long time. This is not such a new idea. It, it only may be new in the sense that the prospect that you might be successful as opposed to being resigned to whatever cards you were dealt uh, may be relatively new. So the instinct to move it and push it and change it and to be optimistic that you could make the world 
or your world something other than it is and to carry that out in, 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 a, in, in, in building I think is, is critical to all of this. In a, in a historic sense, there in, in current times, I mean, there might have been a period when McKim, Mead, and White uh, are making uh, projects like the uh, uh, Boston Public Library or something. And, and it, at the same time, along come uh, characters like Brock and Gray and Picasso who, who see the world in a, in, in a radically different way and I think have moved the discussion from a kind of patronage idea and, and, and a, a certain kind of sophisticated servitude to a much freer interrelationship between client and architect which made a number of other possibilities for who is the client. I think up until that point there was a group, uh, a social class that represented uh, 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 the, the clientele for architects. I think that changed and that also made new things possible. You guys shouldn't leave yet. It's going to get better. Huh? Let's, uh, let's talk about another subject that was raised by, uh, I think, Eric this morning, which may touch on the transformations that began with Picasso uh, uh, and Brock. Um, I, by the way, would argue that what's changed is um, that we now live in a pluralistic society, although it, we would, would appear to be moving back into a uh, dictatorial society. But in the time of Rome, for example, the church financed the Counter-Reformation in, in Rome, uh, and all the churches that we now identify with Rome uh, in order to defend itself against Martin Luther and the, what was then thought of as the heresies of Protestantism. That's why all those churches were built within a period of 50 years, because the church was worried. And if you don't think the church was the establishment and very different from your clients, like Peter Nerva, who's here, I think you need to think about it. Is he a client? Well, he's a, he's a promoter of promoter. your talent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's put it that way. Yeah. All right. Um, this morning we were talking about museums and what were they. And uh, Eric made the comment that people think of what's happened in Culver City as a museum. And I don't, I don't understand that. Maybe you can explain it. I think, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can explain it. I think I was quoting something that uh, uh, I had read uh, somewhere. Uh, and it probably has to do with the fact that museum is now a euphemism for opportunities for architects to do the kinds of things we're talking about and has sometimes a great deal to do with and sometimes relatively little to do with the question of, of, of holding and, and, and uh, displaying uh, art. Um, I, I, I did, in the, in the uh, stream of, of consciousness uh, method that I think I, I work the best in, I wanted, I wanted to say uh, something else about what, what I think moves students and architects uh, in the world now to do the kinds of things that they do and it's 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 a funny word but it, it, it has to do with the love of a certain subject the love of architecture and a commitment to architecture and somehow the definition of a personality 
evolves out of out of out of that kind of connection and that kind of uh, sensibility, and you can feel it. You, you can feel it here. Uh, maybe this, this 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 form is not so conducive to it. But Raymond Abraham sat up here a couple of weeks ago, and you 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 get that. And Tom was here a few weeks ago, and Sorkin and other people, and you get, you get something which which has to do with 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 a very fundamental commitment and defining quality in terms of of making a life and 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 and, and a conception of life and an understanding it seems to take something like that to do almost anything which 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 moves the subject matter around and i think i think you can't leave that out and and, and that's why to some extent all of these decisions are ultimately uh, ultimately uh, uh, personal. Did I avoid the question? Yeah. <laughs> what was the question? The question was the the question the, the question was because three. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that you know there's there are a lot of buildings nowadays which we could say are the cathedrals of our time bank buildings military campus uh, power plants social housing public spaces why we always say that the cathedral of our time are the museums has maybe two reasons first of all a cathedral was always the expression the three-dimensional expression of the culture uh, of the culture and secondly uh, the cathedral or the church was a place where refugees could have protection and I think the the new builded museum could reflect these two points one they could be because people want um, the budgets are not so tight than in social housing for instance so we can build and make statements about how our society be could uh, could be expressed in three dimensions hybrid shapes for instance hybrid solutions and the content, the program of the museum, is actually a refugee in our in our society because no one is really interested in art anymore. So, the museums are um, uh, places, laboratories, where uh, the artist can find a, a place where they can um, think and as long a museum is not a place of information it's not a museum it's just a storage like the history museum in 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 vienna or somewhere else i think a lively museum is a place um, uh, where you can find a direction um, of uh, the discussion of the upcoming future. I'm not so sure that nobody's interested in art anymore. I think there's less interest in the con conventional kind of, of, of art hanging on a wall in a building. I mean, the kind of art that, that, that the, the, the conventional discussion between the architect and the, and, and the curator or the director and the director says give me something straight and give me something generic and give me something simple so I can do what I want to do in that. Uh, one of the things that, that, that uh, intrigued us in Queens was actually how to make a space which would anticipate uh, the, the kind of art which hadn't appeared yet. So, so in that sense, it was a malleable space and amenable to things that we didn't know. And on the other hand, it was, it was, it was formally definitive and prescriptive. So it broke out of the idea that in order to make a conventional, acceptable, uh, usable 
uh, exhibition hall, you had to make a, 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 an orthogonal space. So we tried to have it both ways, both a, a formally prescriptive and obligatory space in which very different, including unnamed uh, uh, kinds of, of, of activities uh, could take place. I, I, one other thing, I mentioned it in, 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 in the initial slides, has to do with the competitive nature of, of uh, museum building, which is, which is an interesting parallel with cathedrals, uh, on which I'm no expert, but, the, but the, the, the standard story of Campaniles that compete for height, or I remember years ago walking, walking into St. Peter's and looking on the floor of St. Peter's and being astonished to see that St. Peter's had made, in the, in, in the floor, they had made a point of here's Chart and here's this and here's that and here's St. Stephen's and here's the other thing. To be, to be clear that, that, that St. Peter's had the longest nave from here to hell or wherever, it is, the biggest, so that, that, that the size issue uh, and the potency of the construction uh, and I think, I think this, this happened to us in Queens where we were actually asked to compete with a baseball stadium uh, and, and, and a zoo uh, and uh, a tennis venue, the Arthur Ashe venue, for the attention of the occupants of, of the people in Flushing. So, so we, we actually produced an idea which had to do with introducing the, the public movement system in the city and in the park, which would run through the museum uh, in order to entice people who were otherwise interested in going to other kinds of events to, to start to pay attention to the museum collection. Wolf, well, the, the museum you're doing in Lyon it seems to me to be a new prototype of museum. It's not meant to hold, primarily I believe, to hold collections, but rather to uh, convey knowledge and information. Yeah. I, I think you should yeah, it's talk actually, about that for yeah, a bit. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not a storage museum, like I uh, would like to say, but, but, but a, a place where um, of information and knowledge is traded. It's about knowledge. Uh, but it's an information place. It's a very lively uh, urban space, a public space. It's not a private space any longer, uh, but an urban space where information, um, you can get the information about everything which is connected to the evolution of our world. But. Um, Eric, uh, in our recent election in, 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 in Austria, no one, everyone was talking about whether uh, we should buy airplanes for a f uh, f uh, new army and, and things like that. No one actually, no one was talking about the cultural program. This was an, uh, very exclusive because I have to say, no one, the majority, the silent, which is very loud nowadays, um, uh, is not interested in art. So the, our responsibility is to stay with the 5% of people who are uh, trading information and uh, marking the point of departure. Yeah. Is that clear now? No. Make it clear. In which sense? Well, in the sense that... So, but, but what I mean, if uh, but, uh, coming back to well, the... You, the were, you said that, that basically departure. nobody is interested in the kinds of things you're interested in, except people who work in similar ways in other disciplines. Yeah. And that and that what we have to do is find those people and work with them to transform the public's attitude toward what we do? Perfect. Perfect. Well, so that's an answer to your question, who is the client? It, apparently, it's not the ordinary person who lives in Austria or the United States. Because Wolf says they're not really interested in what we're up to. 
and this is a, it's an answer to, to, to your former question. Uh, for whom do we build, and what's, what, what's our duty, actually? Yeah? To help all ladies across the street. Yeah, yeah. or to push them on the red, uh, red light on the street. It depends. The, the, problem, the problem of the architects now, they are, they are too obedient. They're really too obedient. They think, uh, if I fulfill the task of the client, I will be very famous and I will be very rich. Wrong, because as an architect, you will never get rich. Uh, period. Yeah. And if you listen to the client, you won't be famous either. Yeah. And being famous as an architect is a fame. <laughs> because, you know, who is famous nowadays at the Rolling Stones? Still. <laughs> and all the other actors. And they get much more money. So if you want to get, uh, earn money, you better go to the movie business, I think. But so the responsibility we have to be aware is that we have to uh, offer solutions for problems they are obviously problems before they get catastrophe. And this is, since we are educated and have experience to uh, build, to make buildings, uh, to design cities, we have to offer a solution for that. Whether you are asked or not. So if you are only waiting till you are asked if the client comes to you, then you are lost. Because then you, you don't, you only answer in the same level. You have to propose, and, and this is what I think Eric and, and we are always trying to do. We, we propose, uh, we, we give um, answers to questions no one is asking. is asking. And this is, I think, the most important thing we can teach the students in our school. That means there are no recipes. And I think this is very important. Recipes, if there would be recipes, it is this easy. And, and I could see, I could see in some methods coming up uh, that the methods are used as recipes for designing building, uh, thinking, um, being aware of uh, what's going on. But there, there are no recipes. We have to find. Uh, we have to find solutions on many levels. In other words, and this is, I think, a kind of very remarkable sentence, that um, every one of us is right, but nothing is correct. Hmm? Sounds serious, huh? Kafka. Uh, kind of. Yeah, maybe. But, I, uh, what what yeah. occurs... What occurs to me is that if you if you make it, if you make it, you make it available. It's not so much a question of 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 taking a poll and somebody says five percent is this and, and ninety five percent is for the army, because because you you can make something available and accessible, and and it it might be productive even if the interest in it a priori was not expressed. Because buildings have a very substantial role in the city, in the organization of the city. And they're visible. They're enormously visible. And this is not a secret. So that you can, you, I mean, architecture has, has the capacity to make the subject matter a subject, whether it was a subject before it came to be a subject on the street of the city or not. So it does give you, it, 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 I mean, if, if, if the question is to provide a solution to the problem that wasn't proposed, having provided the solution, the problem is there, are, there now come to be people who are cognizant of it as a problem. So conceivably it changes the perception of things even if the interest wasn't, ex wasn't expressed before that. Which is what? What are those? Traffic, housing, etc. Yeah. To, to, 
Do you were kind of architect get upset about those kinds of problems? Well, that's the wrong word, I think. Ideology is the wrong word because it, this is not an ideology. No, no. Uh, you know. I don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean by an, an ideology is, is, has some kind of pro forma, some kind of format, some kind of objective. So an ideology without an idol, maybe. Mm -hmm. So ideology with 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 a lowercase i. It has to do with a kind of a belief system without saying what you believe in. I don't know if you if you want to call that ideology. I don't know that help how that helps to clarify the subject matter. I mean, usually when you think of ideology, it's like these guys on the right, these people on the left, these people who believe in this. And these, I mean, I think we're for opening things up, we're for moving things around, we're for taking risks. And I think all of those kinds of attitudes intervene in all of the subjects that Richard is talking about. If you have the same traffic engineers making decisions about freeways, you get the same solutions. If you have the same housing authorities making decisions about housing, you get the same kind of housing. So, so, so the kind of ingredients that we're talking about are not architects, ingredients. I think they have to do with, with fomenting and fermenting so that, so that the subject matter changes and people are prepared to listen to other kinds of inputs and other kinds of strategies. I mean, this would affect housing and this would affect traffic. We, 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 we have to move away from managers, I think. I think I, I, there, there was a, a number of years ago uh, uh, a discussion about notwithstanding the Soviet Union and the United States were supposedly poised to, to eliminate one another, that they were actually moving in a very similar direction. They were moving in a direction which, which was uh, coincident, not divergent. And the coincidence had to do with bureaucracy. You know, it's, it, it's interesting. And, you know, I, was, I was looking in a, the, a book the other day called The Myth of the Machine, which is Mumford's. Finish, finish that point. What do you mean they coincided on bureaucracy? Well, I'm, I'm going to try to finish it, but this is a little bit circuitous because this is the way I think about, about things. And Mumford had very few pictures in his book, The Myth of the Machine. One was the World Trade Center and the other was the Pentagon. And this was, it must have been in the, in the 1960s when this was done. And both of those buildings were put down as, as symbolic, as representative of, of an organization of faceless, nameless people who delivered essentially interchangeable tasks in an interchangeable world. And it may be why, uh, until you look at some of the stuff that Wolf is doing, that buildings like that could be characterized as buildings that have outsides but no insides. Maybe like the people we're talking about. So I think the problem, the, the problem is, is not an American problem or what's popular or what rates in the polls. I think the obstacle is so often bureaucratization and unwillingness to take a position, to take a responsibility, and to use the kind of initiative that I think we're talking about in a small way about what could architecture be. But those qualities in a personal sense could inform any number of, of, of vocations or avocations. And that might change housing and parking as well as museums. I think, uh we have to face the reality that investors and clients think they have the reality. Uh, the investors and the developer always accuses architects that they double the, 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 the budget. That means uh, they exclude a very important issue, the issue of aesthetic. Let me explain that. Uh, but I have to say, this is a very, maybe a very European issue. I don't know what, what the problems 
uh, in the States are here, but I'm talking about Europe. Um, the, the guys who are doing building in a city, they try to make uh, maximum profit machines out of it, which is okay on one hand. On the other hand, they are losing the responsibility that the building has an aesthetic and social impact. So if they only go for money, they call they, they only go for money and they call it reality. The architects lost power because they went um, in the in the face of being obedient instead of uh, pointing out that the aesthetic issue is at least uh, as important as the economic issue. And therefore, the, the, the architects in the last couple of years are, are really pushed into, into, the, into the corner of being illustrator of the ideas of the developer. As long we are not, we are not getting the power back again to advise the politicians, the um, whoever is not asking us who <laughs> advise uh, people. As long we not getting back the power, uh, we are lost. And if we are staying in this illustrative, illustrative way, then our profession will be obsolete very soon. So therefore, I think the strategic thinking how to manage the things like traffic and parking lots is quite clear. But how, what, what, uh, if we can not express the a vision of a city or uh, the, the vision of, um, uh, of a society, um, as long as we can't do that, no one will listen to us. There, there's listen another. To us. Yeah, uh, there's there's another uh, the the concern that that uh, that architects' discussion and that the work of architects would become less and less relevant has also something to do with with the way the subject matter is produced and discussed, and it's why I said initially, who is the audience? Who's our audience? And to whom is this discussion? accessible. As, as I've said at, at SciArc a number of times, I think there, there is something Byzantine and something arcane and something often extremely narrowing and self-serving and every profession is a conspiracy against the public that has to do either with producing architecture in a way which, which suggests it has a special insight and special inside knowledge and these discussions are, are productive in a certain context, but they eliminate an enormous number of people who could be productive participants in the discussion. The beginning of this semester, and I think Syarch has never done this before, we had uh, Rosenfeld and, and, and Gilmore and, and Jan Perry and Con Howe. So we had the councilwoman and we had the head of city planning and we had two major developers. And we were having a discussion, and, and it's conceivable it wasn't the most esoteric discussion, and therefore students were starting to walk out uh, uh, very quickly. But it was an important attempt on, on our part to, to, to implicate other forces in the city and to suggest to them that the discussion here is productive and useful. And there's something important about it, there's something disingenuous about it, because what you, what you learn is don't talk about the design, don't talk about the poetry, don't talk about what Wolf called the aesthetics, talk about organization, management, strategy, tactics, 
and talk about them in terms where there can be a reciprocity in the discussion. Let's say they already know you can make funny looking things. But what they don't know is that, 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 that intellectually that what you can deliver is useful and helpful and productive to a whole group of people who actually have to be brought into the discussion. And this is our attempt, this is our initial attempt and we're continuing to try to do it with the city, with the district, with the property next door, with Jan Perry's area and all of that to bring the faculty uh, to them and them to the faculty and actually in, in a very optimistic way that there actually is more to be shared than there are differences. So it's about an amalgamation and to do that I, I think what I'm saying is you have to jettison a little bit of the specialists language to whom only the specialists are paying attention. And then secretly you can whisper that in a discussion like this. And I think this is, this, is, this is the way to bring a very different audience. I think you can start to see it in Los Angeles. I think it's starting to happen. I'd be interested in how you think about each other's work and where you find uh, consonances and where you find differences. Yeah, then we have to go back to the title you said, Back to Back. Um, I would like to add some, some, some sentences to the issue of strategy. And the, uh, the enemy developer, which are ruling actually the, 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 the city planning um, um, issues. Um, you have to imagine if you compare the, the, the investors with, with an army with thousand tanks and you are one, the one and only, if you build a tank in order to fight them you are lost. You have to invent other strategies, maybe on other weapons uh, in order to, to defeat them. Because we have to defeat them because if they are winning we are only on a one level society. The society could be called take the money and run. But to your question... Uh, I want to say something. Yeah. Oh. I, I think it odd that I, who was once a commissioner in New York City, should make this point, but the Bilbao Museum increased the tax base of that city by 2%, which is a huge number for one building. And Gary is being asked by almost any city that you can think of to come and build a building there. And they're not interested in his organizational strategies or his uh, tough-minded ideas about traffic and parking, they're interested in having something that creates the kind of disturbance that Bilbao did uh, in Spain. And I think what they want is something, put it differently, I think what is going on is that they recognize precisely that power of architecture which both of you discussed uh, earlier. They want an aesthetic, they want something that has that power. They're, they're not looking to, uh, to, to Frank, and I'm beginning to think they're not looking to, to Wolf uh, or to Eric to solve parking problems. I, I actually believe they're looking for something else. Uh, but, but we can do that. <laughs> you know, this is our job as well. 
You can I park, can solve we can park <laughs> parking cars. problems in five minutes. You know how to park this cars. This is not an issue. Yeah, this is, uh, they call it branding. <laughs> so every, every car dealer now wants to have a special house uh, because they, they, they know that otherwise they will not sell their cars anymore because they look very similar. So they have, they have to have different buildings in order to sell that. This is a product design and shopping area. Uh, but this is, this is actually, yeah. I mean, it, I, have to, I have to say, because I'm not very sympathetic to that, I think this is an extremely cynical interpretation of, 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 of what, what architecture is about. And I think it, it, confuse, it, it confuses a kind of resistance. So now resistance, which was certainly a part of, of, of the Gary package for a number of years, is, is now is now a, a transformed uh, going city to city to raise uh, the tax base and and uh, it may be that if you're an architect and this a city presents an opportunity that you really don't give a damn about what their motives are but you have an opportunity to do what you can do and contribute what you can contribute but it probably shouldn't be confused with, with an intrinsic appreciation of what architecture might do, which when, when we talk about it, we're talking about undermining and altering, and the question starts to be finally, who's undermining whom? And if, if, if the architecture which sets out, which, which, which sets out to alter the perspective or change the vision or, or is uncomfortable with the way it is and comes ultimately to, to, to service the people who are determining what is, then, then something got lost in, in the translation. And I mean, it occurs to me, I mean, there's a very interesting example of, of, and very tangible and took a lot of courage. I don't know how the hell he did it. On, on the part of the Mac and, and, uh, and uh, Peter Nover, who foresaw something radical, uh, uh, maybe not so radical, something changing in Cuba sooner or later. And he proposed that, that, that a number of architects, and he invited a number of architects to come and essentially to, to, to look again at what Havana could be minus the Armani, Reebok, McDonald's vision of, of, of what some people call branding, again, which I think is to con confuse ratings and popularity uh, with, with uh, creativity. They're not synonymous. I think they're antonyms. And he proposed that, and, and a number of architects made, made uh, uh, substantial efforts to introduce ideas which, which would ameliorate this kind of homogenization of the world in terms, in terms of brands and mercantilism. And I think, I think uh, uh, that, that, that architecture and critical thinking has to, has to stand in opposition to selling as imaginative. It can't be about both. I mean, you can't have it both ways, Eric. You can't claim for architecture the power to transform the way people think and feel, and then when someone actually succeeds in doing precisely what you're talking about, refer to him as cynical at the age of 73 because he continues to develop a line of architecture that you can see beginning 40 years ago and flourishing now. You want, you want it both ways. You want to succeed with a transformative example and then you want to say, well, if I've succeeded, I must have failed because no one is resisting me. They're liking what I'm doing, therefore I failed. <laughs> I, think, I, like, think you, I think you missed This is good, yeah. They like my building, therefore I failed. <laughs> they love it, 
Well, uh, there's a line that you can do everything right and it comes out wrong. You can do everything wrong. I wasn't talking about yeah, the yeah. cynicism of the architect. That's not what I said at all and not what I meant. I was talking about the cynicism of the people who hired the architect, yeah. who, in, who, who did not anticipate. This has nothing to do with the architect. It has to do with the people who, in many ways, resisted the building through every kind of roadblock. And then when Iberian Airlines started showing up three times a day instead of two times a week, they said, oh, this is a great success. Let's do it more. This is actually not the architect. These are the people who, who you said, wanted to increase the tax base and this is the reason for architecture but Let's do wasn't it. that the, always the that way in, the increase in the tax base was a consequence that no one ever anticipated That's right. That's right. So this but you're asking a lot you're asking to transform society into uh, architectural critics not only that but architectural critics of a certain kind with the sophistication that the architect himself brings to his own work. I mean, Oldenburg doesn't sound too bad to me, uh, helping old ladies across the street. You, you want everybody to be trained to like what you do? Why are you picking on, why are you picking on old I think you just have a problem of, what is all this about old ladies? Somebody's going to say, where are the old men or something? Well, now I'm picking on 73-year-olds. Uh, I, th I think, I think that there is a very fundamental, and, and, and uh, I remember um, not, not to cite a, a sanctified name, but, but a number of years ago, uh, Bob Venturi talking about whether he was better when everybody liked him or when nobody liked him. And I think, I think what, what is difficult for you and is a difficult proposition is not to have it both ways because there are many things that actually work on you in both ways. And they both have some truth and they both have some validity and they create a kind of tension. And I think you need to learn to live in the tension. It's like saying you have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And it, and it is a fact, I think, that, that the initiative and the exploration and the investigation, if we want to talk about whoever you like, but in this case, in this case uh, Frank, happened in, in, in an unusual kind of isolation. First, nobody was interested, and then Los Angeles was interested, but in some ways Los Angeles didn't count because it either the weather was wrong or the intellect was wrong or the sophistication wasn't substantial enough. And ultimately, it came to be part of a kind of lexicon and language. And, and it, 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 this doesn't detract from the architect, but, it, but it, it, it is important to see it now as a kind of piece of a vocabulary. There was no room for it. It wasn't in the world. And somebody created it and made room for it. And now it has lots and lots of room. And it, the, the question is, what does that mean? What does that mean for, for the adventure of making it and for the fact of its rejection? and for the later fact of its acceptance, what is it? Because it's not what it was initially, it's become something else. I mean, is it, is it, does it ultimately become McKim and Gree has to show up in order to tear it down? This is why the first subject over here was about burning things and no accident. I think my case rests no, it, it, uh, actually, the, the, the branding was always a game in the, in the, in the, the game of client and architect. If you know, the Pope wanted to have the, the most famous church, and uh, the, the king wanted to have the most famous palace. And, uh, and basically, the people of the city in Vienna actually came to this palace and applauded because it, it was the greatest new building of the, of the world, yeah? Because our king did it. So that's the difference now, because <laughs> people hate when new things are coming up <coughs> and they don't applaud in order. No, no, in opposite, they try to prohibit it, yeah? 
This is a democracy on the other hand, so I don't care too much about being branded or not, as long we can uh, go through with all the ideas we want to build. Of course you have to make compromises, otherwise, you know, you, you would be stupid and stubborn is the, the, the better way. That reminds me on, on, uh, on, on a critic uh, who, who came to our office 20 years ago and he said, okay, I wish you will uh, never build because your designs and models are so ugly. They look destroyed, tortured, and whatever. Uh, ten years later, we had the same projects in an exhibition. He came and said, you know, you have to change because you are so slick now. <laughs> and now, ten years later, we are building this thing. So this is the, the way of an architect. But what I mean is that you have to, to go for 220% in order to get 80, because they cut away uh, 240% of your ideas. So if you start with 80%, you, you, you will end up with minus 40%. So, okay, this is the strategy Wall Street. we have. Uh, let, me, let, me do, let me try another example. <laughs> I, if, uh, let me try one yeah, more is, and see if, now see it's it, if, very, if we can offend, very, if we can offend <laughs> the old men. Um, if, if the idea, I'm trying to think of a good example for this, and I can, I can, I can think of, a, of, of an architect's example, Eero Saarinen, and I can think of, of a literary example in, in James Joyce, whose work interested me for a long time, although not so much recently. And I think if, uh, let me do Joyce first, but if you look at The Dubliners, which is a series of short stories, and you look at Daedalus and the portrait of the artist, and you look at Ulysses, and you look at Finnegan's Wake, what is, is the message, I think, is that the subject matter isn't, it's not a matter of a critic coming and saying you're doing this, and a critic coming back 10 years later and looking at the same work, but the world has moved, and therefore the critic moved but that the subject matter also moved so that the Dubliners and the portrait and Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake are always about three steps ahead of whoever is looking. So this is, this is a somewhat different idea, which means the, the, the job is to continue to look at your own work, not so much in terms of what the critic thinks about it or what, or, or what the people who think if they hire you the tax base will go up, but whether you're satisfied with a, with a paradigm or an idea or a conception of working and drawing and building, or whether that has to move, and I think I think I think Joyce is an interesting example. Don't be satisfied. Don't be complacent. I know there are any number of examples that 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 one could argue in a different way. So we don't have to argue then about the world catching up to you because conceptually the world will never catch up to you because you're always moving. So this is a different idea. This is what I like on Eric. When we, when we had review, we, we always end up with discussing literature. And at the very end of the review, we are just talking in Bob Dylan uh, quotes. <laughs> Back to back, I have to explain that. Shoulder to shoulder, back to back. Um, in our self-expressing society, um, the, the 19th century uh, ideology, uh, ideology uh, is that the artist and the architect has to be the one, the genius. I think this, is, this has changed anyway. So the teamwork is coming up in the forefront of uh, the architectural uh, procedure. Um, and this is another reason to be back on back. Um, if you stand back to back, you can move defended, so to say, through the space very freely. If you, if you just one alone, you have to cover your back by going along the wall. 
And what I like in, really, but uh, what I really liked in LA was the friendship with many of my colleagues. And I was really impressed, and I have to say that when I came here the first time, I visited Rotandi, <laughs> Michael. And the first thing he showed me was not a building of Morphosis. He showed me a building of Eric Moss. And I think that explains a little bit the sympathy I have for LA and the architectural scene here. It doesn't explain my, 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 my appreciation of Eric's very ugly buildings. Uh, because I always felt uh, his aesthetic uh, uh, close to sadomasochism, uh, <laughs> chains, whips and chains, uh, tortured things. This was my first impression, you know? Then he was using materials. <laughs> then uh, when we... <laughs> That there was the Prince of Chunk, you know. <laughs> so I always said, okay, this is uh, this is um, a similarity to to our work because um, Vienna and LA is connected in a very unconscious way. So what's plus ten in LA is minus ten in Vienna and vice versa. So when, um, but getting older getting more in a uh, kind of quiet mood, not being so aggressive anymore, I'm, I'm considering where the shapes of Eric are coming from. And it's quite clear it's not the sadomasochism <laughs> thing because I couldn't see in the, in the theater in Petersburg any chains anymore. Uh, but there is another background, and I would like to explain that. Yeah. Uh, in the uh, we we are very the Austrian architects and the Dutch architects are very competitive uh, in in terms, especially the young ones. They want to be the Austrian architects want to be as famous as the the Dutch guys. Um, and I told them, as long you are doing diagrams behind them, you will never get the reputation you should have, um, or you will have if you go along with the special ability of the Viennese or the Austrian architects, namely uh, celebrating space. You have to imagine it would never have been possible that a, a guy like Rietfeld is doing a building in Vienna and I cannot see any Baroque building in Holland. But there's another, another issue and it, it, it touches a little bit the religious background as well. So I try to divide right now the world in, 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 in kind of the Catholic Baroque architects, the Dutch Calvinistic, the, and the Jesuit Spanish guys. And there is another issue, and this is the Kabbalistic way of thinking of my Jewish friends, which are very, very related to the Baroque Viennese way of thinking, but in the outforming of the shape, very different. Nevertheless, there is a appreciation in the, in the ugly shapes of Eric because he is not going for the shape like we are going for. What I can see is the point of departure at the same level. The attitude means the spine is very similar. Both are not broken. Maybe <laughs> we have a little bit ache, but uh, pain but it's not broken. And uh, the result, when it's built, not in the models, but when it's built, is the experience of space. Very different, but 
very similar. So it's like, let's say, if he would be the uh, Louis Kahn of our generation, we are the Corbusier of our generation. Yeah? That sounds nice, huh? Actually, his lectures are, are very similar to the Louis Kahn lectures. Yeah, um, 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 I just once he heard um, Louis Kahn talking about his architecture, and then he was talking about a literature, James Joyce, <laughs> Light, and all the other things. And he You're never just touched the issue because they can't translate Joyce into German. That's true. But the, how do you read Kafka? They can't translate it. <laughs> <laughs> can't translate it this is funny English, when uh, when Eric is explaining me what Kafka means in German. <laughs> um, Richard asked me if 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 I wanted to uh, comment on on the work that Wolf and and Helmut do, and uh, it's actually in some ways some ways easy for me and, and we've discussed a lot of these things for, for years and years. Um, I, the best way I can explain it is I, I remember seeing this, this speaking of ugly, Jesus, uh, the, going to see the, the rooftop building and, and starting to cry actually. Um, that that uh, it in in an emotive sense that that uh, the, the capacity to do that and and to do that in that context and 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 to construct it and all of that was was is still one of the remarkable pieces of architecture in, in the last period and and. Uh, Especially when you realize the, the, the difficulty in doing it, I, I think it, it, it's not only remarkable, but I think what, what for all its boisterousness, I'm glad to hear you're, you're not aggressive anymore. This is news, news to too me. Tired. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm getting too tired. That just happened five minutes ago or something. <laughs> But, but there is something about the work which I think is, is so human and so personal and at the same time so it's extremely fragile. Um, and and uh, I'm sure Wolf could do better in German than he did. When you're talking about cantilevers, you're actually talking about something which is extremely precarious and tense and maybe it won't actually make it. And the condition in which we're working in a human sense and the, con and the condition of conceptualization and actualization of building things in a constructed sense are, syn are synonymous in his case. That means the work and the life are one thing. And I think this is quite remarkable. Actually, it's almost impossible uh, to do it. And it, it has that personal aspect, the fragility and all of that. But by extension, we were talking about lessons and handing, handing ideas to people who didn't ask to be handed those ideas. But I think you, you experience those kinds of buildings and you feel it. And, and in that sense, the fragility of the, of the building belongs to, to, to every human who walks by it. And it reminds them of that, and I think in in a spatial way, in its own language. And I think this is this is really a, quite a remarkable kind of contribution. I don't think too many people can claim that. It's uh, it's pretty late, but but uh, Eric and Wolf would take uh, a few questions, and then we'll finish with uh, a silent few seconds of, uh, of slides from each of them. If there's a question, <clears throat> please ask it, and we'll repeat it for um, everybody. May 
I have your permission to conclude the evening with a few more slides. Thank you. Did you? <laughs> Eric, I love you. Thank you. Thanks.